Hello and welcome to the Virtual Technology Summit, What's New for Oracle and .NET session. I'm Christian Shea and with me is Alex Key. And today we're going to introduce to you um, the new features that we have for .NET and Oracle developers. Now, uh, during this presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them during the presentation. We have people standing by to answer your questions. Now we've broken this session up into two parts. Each one of them is one hour in length. Uh, in the first part, we will start by introducing our .NET products and our Oracle Data Access component releases. Then we'll talk about new features supporting Oracle multi-tenant. Then we'll introduce Schema Compare and Visual Studio. And finally, um, talk about ODP.NET Managed Driver. And in the second hour, we will introduce NuGet. We'll talk about new entity framework features. We'll talk about ease of ODP.NET development and migration, migration enhancements that we've added. And finally, we'll talk about some new functionality for high availability. And before we dive into the new features, let's just talk about our .NET functionality as an overview. So as you can see, um, Oracle's been committed to the .NET platform since it started out uh, back in the early 2000s. So as you can see from this graphic, as Microsoft came out with new versions of .NET and new versions of Visual Studio through the years, we have always had a new version of our data provider and other tools to support that. So in this graphic where you see ODAC, that means Oracle Data Access Components, which is our bundle of .NET products. So not only did we support the latest features in .NET and the latest Visual Studio versions, but as you can see, we also added support for the enterprise features in new Oracle database versions as it went from Oracle 9i all the way up through Oracle 12c. And so today we're going to be talking about the new features we've added to our .NET products, which you can see the individual ones um, here on your screen. Now, all of these products are free and downloadable from the OTN website. So Oracle Developer Tools for Visual Studio, this is our tightly integrated add-in for Visual Studio um, that makes it possible to do things like edit and debug PL SQL, create tables, generate SQL scripts, integrate with Entity Designer or Table Adapter Configuration Wizard, etc. The Oracle Data Provider for .NET is our workhorse uh, ADO.NET uh, provider. So not only do we support all the ADO.NET features you're familiar with, but we also extend it support to support our enterprise Oracle features. And Oracle providers for ASP.NET lets you store website state uh, coming from Visual Studio ASP.NET widgets like login control, sitemap control. It lets you store those into Oracle database. And finally, Oracle database extensions for .NET allows you to write store procedures in Oracle using Visual Basic or C Sharp. Now, as I mentioned, um, all of these products are available for free download, and it's, they're available from the URL that's on your screen there, otnoracle.com slash .net. So if you're going to write anything down today, that would be the URL to write down. Um, and then on that site, we also have white papers, tutorials, uh, YouTube videos, um, a great set of uh, discussion forums, um, uh, a, a way to request and vote on new features, and it's also a great way to find out what's, uh, what's the latest news and releases available to you. Now, we do have an announcement to make uh, very shortly after you watch this presentation. Um, ODAC 12C Release 4 will be made available. So this will, among other features, support Visual Studio 2015. So keep an eye on our OTN website and on our Twitter account for announcements of when this release will be officially available. Okay, uh, now let's move along to the first new feature. Uh, you may have heard about Oracle Multi-Tenant, a new feature in Oracle Database 12C. 
Well, um, Oracle multi-tenant is positioned for DBAs, for example, as a way to for database consolidation. So now your individual databases are represented as pluggable databases. And these pluggable databases plug into a container database. And they're able to share resources and take advantage of things like patching so you patch the container database and it automatically patches the individual pluggable databases and this multi-tenant uh, container database functionality is actually really great for developers as well so it'll allow you to quickly make copies of databases unplug them and plug them into other locations so for example if you have a test database you want to make a copy of it move it over to the development database it's very easy to do you can also quickly spin up and destroy test instances for testing purposes so I say that it's very fast. It really only takes about as long as it would take to physically copy database files. So a matter of minutes to make a copy of one of your test databases. But by comparison, using the database configuration assistant to create a database takes a long time. And then when you're sharing with other developers, um, all you have to do is unplug your database, which becomes a single XML file and several DBF files. You can zip these up and share them with other developers who can in turn plug them in and be using them uh, as another database in a matter of minutes. And so we've added this Oracle multi-tenant functionality into Oracle Developer Tools for Visual Studio. And I will be giving you a demo of that in just a minute. But we've integrated these features so that they show up when you look at your database in Server Explorer. And in Server Explorer, you'll see a pluggable databases node. This will show you all the pluggable databases in your container database. So uh, hanging off of that node will be some menu options, a new pluggable database, which, lets, which allows you to quickly create a new database from the seed database, uh, plug, which lets you plug in um, a database you got from elsewhere using the XML file and some DBF files that came with it, on each individual pluggable database node, um, we have menu options for clone, which makes a quick copy of a pluggable database. Unplug, which removes the pluggable database from the container and creates that XML manifest. Um, open and close, which is the equivalent of a startup and a shutdown of the database. And delete, which removes the PDB uh, completely from the container and deletes any of the files associated with it. Now, before we get to the demo, one more detail. Um, when you create a new or clone a pluggable database in Visual Studio, we will update the tnsnames.org or a network entries uh, for you and we'll connect to the new database in Server Explorer using the admin user. That way you can explore it right after creating a new one or cloning it. Now, in the case of plugging in a pluggable database, we won't be able to do that for you. So you will need to create the alias yourself or use Easy Connect Connect String. So um, to do that, the uh, connect info for the pluggable database is the same as the container, the host, the port, etc. But the service name has the same name typically as the pluggable database name. And I should mention that if you're connecting inside code using ODP.NET to a pluggable database, you don't have to do anything special. Um, it just connects implicitly as long as you provide the service name for the pluggable database. And with that, let's do a demo of Oracle Multi-Tenant with Visual Studio. So the first thing we need to do is to connect in Server Explorer. This assumes that we've installed Oracle Developer Tools for Visual Studio. So when we add the connection, we need to make sure to use ODP.NET as the data source, or else you won't see any of these features. So now we need to connect as SysDBA. So use an account that has SysDBA privileges, and we will connect to a container database, an Oracle 12C container database. If those conditions are met, if it's an Oracle 12C container database, then when we look at it in Server Explorer, we will see a pluggable databases node. 
And this pluggable databases node contains, always contains a seed database. That's what makes it so fast to make new databases. It just makes a physical copy of that seed. Now, if you right click on the pluggable databases node, among other things, you'll see new pluggable database menu item. So if you choose that, you'll get the dialog to create that new pluggable database. And it will ask you for an admin name and password and give you options for where the data files will be located. Now note that this path is based on the server, which I'm using Windows, but it could be Linux and the paths would look different. Now I'll cancel that dialog because what I want to do is make a copy of my PDB or CL database, a clone, and give that copy to a fellow developer. So I choose clone from the menu item and it will bring the clone pluggable database um, dialog up for me to choose. So I'll give it a new name, clone PDB or CL and provide the uh, admin username and password for PDBORCL. And there, once again, the data file locations are provided. I click OK and it will start the process of making a copy of my pluggable database. Now when it's all done, what you will see happen is it will actually create a TNS alias in my tnsnames.oral file and connect in Server Explorer to the new pluggable, the cloned pluggable database. So there it is right there. Um, clone PDBORCL is the name of the alias that's in my uh, database. Now, what I'd like to do is unplug this new uh, clone. PDB or CL and give it to a fellow developer to work on. So um, first thing I'll do is I'll remove that connection that I have to it, uh, one of the data connections, and then I'll right click and choose um, unplug. And this will bring up the unplug pluggable database dialog and it's going to create that XML file that you see there with some metadata about the database. And then it will remove it from the container database so it's no longer running and no longer um, using any resources. And we can go to the location where uh, this database is stored under or data and look at what it did. So you can see that it created the XML file and there are the database files. And I can take this whole group of files, I can zip it up, and I can give it to any developer who can in turn plug it back into their database. So let's pretend we're a developer who received a zip file with those pluggable database files in it, and let's plug it into our container database. So what we do is we right click and choose plug, and then we point in the in the dialog we point to the XML file which has the locations of the, the DBF file stored inside of it. We click OK and in a matter of minutes the uh, database will be plugged into my container database and running. And there it is. It's running and we can go into uh, the data connections node and connect to it. So I'll connect as HR and provide a clone PDBORCL alias, which was created earlier automatically by us. And you can see that indeed we can see tables inside of the pluggable database. And now let's move on to our next new feature, schema compare tools in Visual Studio. These are also part of the Oracle developer tools for Visual Studio. So Schema compare tools allow you to compare two schemas that are in either the same database or in different databases. And it allows you to visually inspect the differences and also generate a diff script for deployment purposes. You can do reverse schema compare to generate rollback scripts and you can compare down to the granularity of individual schema types such as comparing all tables or all packages etc.
So the typical use case is um, a development shop has a development database and they have a production database. And as you work on a new version of your application, the development schema evolves to meet the needs of that application. And then along the way, you use schema compare tools to inspect what has changed, such as PL SQL uh, package changes. Um, and then you use schema compare to generate a diff script, which is then deployed along with your application and is run against the target database to bring it up to the level that the application expects. So let's uh, do a demo of a schema compare. Okay, we're back in Visual Studio again, and since I've installed Oracle Developer Tools for Visual Studio, you can look up in Server Explorer and you can see I've got two databases available to me, a development instance and a production instance. Now right now, these are identical. I haven't started working on the next version of my app yet, but we can run Schema Compare, which is a menu item hanging off of one of the connections to prove that they're identical. So we just fill in the, um, the source and target and run it. And quickly we see that they are indeed identical. Now we start working on our application. So let's quickly create a new project for our application, uh, just a console application. And now what we're gonna do is add to the solution a Oracle database project to maintain our scripts. So if you go to the Oracle section of Add New Project and click Oracle Database Project, uh, it will then ask you uh, if you're going to default to a particular database, which one do you want to run it on? We'll say production. And now we have a storage place for any scripts that we generate. Now, as we're working on our application, as it changes, we may realize that we need to um, get some additional information from a table that's not currently stored there. So in this case, the job history table, we want it to contain um, an employee's birthday. So what we'll do is we'll run the table designer and we'll add a birthday column so that we can use it in our application. So data type of date and save it. And then you can see in Server Explorer that it will show up now as part of the table. And then further, as we're developing our app and a PL SQL associated that, we realize that the add job history store procedure also has a dependency on this table. So we need to go in there and we need to modify this to add the ability to check the, the birthday column. So we'll type in um, an additional parameter to this procedure. And then we'll modify the insert clause inside of the procedure um, to allow for the birthday. And then we'll compile it and then we need to check the output window just to make sure it compiled successfully which it did and with that we've made all the changes that our application needs uh, from the database now what if we want to visualize uh, the changes uh, that have been made by us or other developers in our team so we can run schema compare again And this time you see there are differences. So we can scroll down and we see that there's differences in the table and also differences in the procedures. So if we look at the various tables, we can see that indeed job history is different. And we can look even at the object definition to, to drill down and see precisely what about the table has changed. And we can see that the birthday column has been added.
And you can also look at the update statement that would need to be made to bring the production database up to the level of the development database. So similarly, let's look at the procedure that changed, add job history, and you can see the two lines or three lines that I modified are now highlighted here in schema compare. So it's a good way to visualize the changes. Now let's generate a diff script so that we can bring the production schema up to the level of the development schema. Now you can see export to editor is an option to bring it all into one flat file, but we're going to send it over to the database project. Now what this does is it shreds the changes into a single master script and then several detail scripts. So if you look at one of the detail scripts, the table changes will go under the tables uh, folder and we can see that there's that alter statement. And similarly for the procedure, it just does a create or replace with the change. So now we can right click on the master script and say run on and it will use SQL plus behind the scenes to run this script and it will run it against the production database because that's what we want to bring up to the level of the development schema. Now let's check the output window to make sure that the script ran without error, and it did. And now the development and production schemas should be identical. We can prove that by running schema compare again. We can just press the refresh button. And as you can see, they are indeed identical. So this concludes the schema compare demo. Now I'll turn it over to Alex Key to talk about the next new feature. Thanks, Christian. Hi, my name is Alex Key. I am the product manager for the Oracle Data Provider 4.NET and wanted to talk to you a bit about the new managed driver. Uh, but before we begin, just wanted to remind you that if you want to ask questions, you can do so in the chat window. So as we go along in this presentation, if you have any questions, just ask and uh, we'll be able to answer those as we go along. So one of the new features, major new features we had in Oracle Database 12C is the managed driver for ODP.NET. And the main reason why we introduced it was we wanted to make it simpler to deploy and use the Oracle Data Provider. Now, right now what you see on your screen is the ODP.NET unmanaged driver architecture. This is our original ODP.NET driver. And on the left side, you see that in ODP.NET, we have the Oracle.DataAccess DLL. This DLL is fully managed. It's always been fully managed when we first introduced it. And what it sits on top of is the rest of the Oracle client layer. To the right of that, you have the unmanaged stack, which includes ODP.NET's own unmanaged DLLs. Then the Oracle call interface, which we abbreviate to OCI. That's a C layer. And then Oracle networking layer, which we'll just call net. And then all that sits on the client client layer and communicates with the Oracle database. So this is what Oracle has been using since we first introduced the ODP.NET driver uh, back over a decade ago. And it's worked very well for people. It's allowed us to build a lot of new functionality for .NET developers very quickly because we can build it on top of Oracle's existing C interfaces, which have done all the major logic uh, a lot of the app, the logic work needed to uh, put in the high availability, the high performance features, things like that. And we just put ODP.NET on top to be able to enable that. But certainly for a lot of customers who want to be able to uh, deploy much more easily in ODP.NET, they want something much simpler to use. So we've introduced the managed ODP.NET driver, which we call ODP.NET managed driver. And you can see here from this architecture picture, it's much simpler. We have a single DLL. In most cases, we'll have a single DLL. I'll explain a little bit later when you need a, a one or two additional DLLs. But in most cases, you're going to have a single DLL. It's called Oracle Data Access DLL. And that will connect directly to the Oracle database. The ODP. The OD, Oracle Managed Data Access DLL is a fully managed driver. It's all C-sharp, all built in .NET. There's no, uh, no unmanaged code at all. And we go directly to the Oracle database. So you can see dealing with one DLL becomes much simpler. It becomes easier to deploy, easier to manage. And you don't have to worry about 
conflicts with, say, uh, different versions of unmanaged DLLs and different versions of the Oracle client, which can come up with you if you use the unmanaged driver. Let's talk a bit about differences between managed ODP and unmanaged ODP. So what are the benefits of managed ODP? Why did we introduce this new driver? Well, if you are using 32-bit.NET Framework and 64-bit.NET Framework, it's easier to deploy just one assembly that works with all of them. That way you don't need to keep track of if you're using the 32-bit client or the 64-bit client for ODP.NET. You just deploy oracle.managedataccess.dll, works for both. Great. Another reason is it's easier to deploy side by side with other Oracle clients. So if you have, you know, two different ODP.NET applications and they use two different versions of ODP.NET uh, and you want to deploy them side by side, you can do that easily with managed ODP.NET. You give one app, uh, one version of the managed DLL and another app, the other version of managed DLL. Whereas with the unmanaged side, you would have to uh, deploy the two Oracle database clients and then also make sure that those uh, clients are properly picked up by the oracle.dataaccess.dll, uh, meaning that they will be first in the path for that application, which you can do. You can do quite easily by setting the DLL path setting in unmanaged ODP.NET. However, um, uh, many people may not be aware of that setting or they don't want to have to keep managing it. So it's just easier for them to work in a completely .NET realm and just use uh, Oracle.managed data access completely. One of the other benefits that we've seen with using the managed ODP.NET driver and building it is that the binaries to deploy are much smaller than with unmanaged ODP.NET. So unmanaged ODP.NET consists of uh, the oracle.dataaccess.dll plus all the Oracle client files, and that becomes about you know 150 megs all zipped up. Whereas with managed ODP.NET, it's only a few DLLs, and that's all less than 10 megs all zipped up. It's actually smaller than that, but you know certainly things can grow a little bit as we add more functionality. But uh, it's uh, it's pretty good that we can say that it's much, much smaller, over 10 times smaller than what we used to have with unmanaged ODP.NET. Uh, the patching becomes much easier. Uh, you can now just replace a single DLL or a few DLLs. Um, you don't need to go through necessarily the, the O patch process uh, and, and apply the patch on top of the Oracle client, which uh, will replace some of the files for the patching. Uh, so it becomes a much simpler process because you can uh, just uh, just copy it in place, and and you're basically, and then if you need to do any configuration, you can, but uh, it could be as patching can be as simple as just a copy. And of course, being a fully dot .net, net managed assembly, it can integrate with code access security completely. Whereas uh, you only could do it partially with unmanaged ODP with the Oracle dot data access DLL, because more of the code or all of the code for the client side has been moved into a single oracle.managed data access DLL. Um, you can now manage that completely with code access security to in, in order to securitize your, your uh, assemblies. So that's another nice benefit of this uh, new managed ODP.NET. That does not mean, however, unmanaged ODP.NET doesn't have a lot of nice uh, uh, features and, and reasons for using it. There's still a lot of great reasons to use unmanaged ODP and we do expect from Oracle we expect uh, that you will continue to have both of these assemblies both managed and unmanaged continue on for quite some time. We expect them to both exist and one is not going to displace the other because there are benefits to using unmanaged and there are benefits to using managed. So what are the benefits to using unmanaged? More functionality for one and it will remain so like this in, into the future. New features will always be introduced into unmanaged first or at the same time as unmanaged and managed, but unmanaged will generally will, will be first or will be at the same time as managed. And the reason why is uh, the ben is, goes down to kind of the architecture you saw with unmanaged. The functionality that Oracle introduces new will get supported by OCI, by the OCI layer, since it's supporting a lot of other Oracle uh, client technologies besides .NET. Because it's there, ODP.NET can then easily piggyback on those on that functionality. So 
there are teams building all this functionality to enhance the Oracle database functionality from the client side and ODP.NET from Unmanaged can easily just piggyback on that, just build some .NET APIs in order to uh, enable that technology. Whereas if we did it for Managed, if we had to support it for Managed, we'd need to port all that code uh, or implement it firstly into the uh, Managed driver. So we need to convert that all to, to C Sharp and be able to support it. Uh, the other thing is we have to make sure that if we rely on third-party assemblies uh, from uh, uh, things such as maybe, uh, well, Kerberos is a great example of that. Uh, if we had to rely on a third-party Kerberos functionality, we need to, uh, that functionality, if it doesn't have a .NET uh, a counterpart, uh, we would need to have that ported over to .NET in order to use it or have another assembly that can call into unmanaged code. So you're going to still see more functionality with unmanaged ODP, but over time, that difference will also will decrease. And of course, because unmanaged ODP has been out for uh, a decade or so longer than managed ODP, uh, you've got that gap already. So we're going to be closing that, uh, and you'll see the difference in functionality will get less and less over time, but there will always be some gap. The other advantage, because it has been around for a decade or so longer, is that unmanaged ODP.NET is more mature. It's, um, it's been battle tested by lots and lots of companies who are using .NET with Oracle. So a lot of the bugs have are completely out of it, and you will get a much more uh, a much a better runtime experience in general. But that advantage will decline as well as more and more people use the managed ODP.NET layer and use it in different circumstances. And Oracle cleans out all the bugs from that as well. So. That's kind of the pros and cons of using each one, since many people would like to know that. But let's talk about more about Managed ODP, and also let's do some demos with it. Um, before I start on the demos, I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction of the actual nuts and bolts of using the Managed ODP.NET driver. Uh, it's a 100% managed provider, as I explained. And the assembly is oracle.managedataccess.dll. A nice thing about ManageODP.NET is that no other client file, Oracle client files are required. So there you can just use oracle.managedataccess.dll and then have your application just run. You don't need any other unmanaged clients. Now in a couple cases you might need a couple additional managed files to run, but no other unmanaged files are needed uh, in order to run your .NET application with Oracle. Those two are oracle.managedataccess.dtc.dll and oracle.managedataccess.iop.dll. I'll just call them DTC and IOP for short. Now, DTC DLL, that's used for distributed transactions. If you have a distributed transaction and you need to use the managedodp.net, this will help coordinate your transaction and the reason why we have this DLL is it's, it's actually a fully managed DLL, but it makes COM API calls. And the reason why it needs to make COM API calls is because uh, those APIs are only available in an unmanaged DTC layer uh, from Microsoft. Now, Oracle and Microsoft, we work together. And in .NET 452, Microsoft introduced these DTC calls as fully managed calls so that Oracle would no longer have to deploy this DLL for customers. So if you're using .NET 452 or later, you, you will be able to use distributed transactions, but you won't have to distribute this specific DTC DLL because all the API calls will be fully managed, so you don't need this uh, DTC DLL. But if you use some earlier than .NET 452, so 451 or earlier, then you will need to use this DTC DLL for your distributed transactions, and obviously because it's un because these are uh, you know, unmanaged calls, 32 bit or 64 bit, you'll have to choose the right Oracle.managed data access DTC version for 32 bit, and if it's a 32 bit .NET framework you're working with, within or 64 bit version of it, if you're working with a 64 bit .NET framework. If you're using Kerberos, it's the same. In this case, uh, the Kerberos um, uh, the Kerberos functionality Oracle is using on the client side comes from a third party, and that third party uh, only has a C-based 
C-based layer. So because it has a C-based layer rather than a fully .NET managed uh, layer, we have to call into that, that C-based layer. So you'll have to deploy a 32-bit IOP or 64-bit IOP if you happen to be using uh, Kerberos. So that, that's how we get around some of the functionality that's not there. We give you another DLL that if you're using this additional functionality, you can then deploy it and use it within your application. In terms of namespaces, the differences are we've got oracle.managedataaccess.client and then .types. And the only difference here is instead of .dataaccess.client and .dataaccess.types, we add the word managed. And everything else is uh, basically the same. Everything else except for uh, setting up your connection strings and your .aura files, which uh, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. But everything else in terms of developing your application will be virtually the same when you use managedodp.net. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at a few demos about how to use it. And, then, and through this demo, I'll also uh, show you an example of what I mean by having to change how you set up your connect descriptor and maybe your sqlnet.aura and ldap.aura. Because one of the interesting things that we've introduced with this ODP.NET managed driver is that you don't really need an Oracle home anymore. Or the Oracle home as a concept does not really exist. So the network directory, admin network uh, directory, is not necessarily going to be there for the Oracle client to say, you know, look for its TNS names.ora or SQLnet.ora files and things like that. So we've done some interesting things there, and I'll show you in some of these demos. But let's start with the basics. So I've got Visual Studio here. And uh, we don't have a project yet, so let's create a project. So new project. And we'll create a C-sharp project. We'll keep it basic. It'll be a console application. We're just going to do some basic data retrieval from the Oracle database using C-sharp and ODP.NET. And we're going to do this with the managed ODP.NET driver. So let's see how we do that. So first thing we want to do is let's pull that assembly into our references. So I have it already installed, obviously, so we'll add a reference. I'll right click on references and we'll add a reference. We'll look under extensions in the assemblies and we'll drop down here. And we see here Oracle.manage data access. So let's zoom in, take a look at it. So what we can do is we'll select Oracle.manage data access. We'll add it to our project by saying OK. And you can see that it's been added here as part of our project references. Once we do that, let's uh, cut and paste some code. And you'll see the two using statements that we have added are oracle.managedataaccess.client and oracle.managedataaccess.types. Very similar to the ones for unmanaged ODP.NET. So not much you have to learn in terms of new uh, namespaces. And then we're, all we're going to do is we're going to uh, just select from the HR table the employees and uh, retrieve the employees from department 20. To do that, we're going to first connect. We're going to give it a connection string. We have the data source here. And you can see I've put in the entire uh, connect descriptor. It's going to be a database called uh, uh, ORCL. And it's, it's on the local machine. So we access it through local host, host name. We create a connection, give it the connection string, open the connection. Then we create a command. From that command, we give it the text to use. Select the first name from employees where the department is equal to 20. Execute it, then output the results. And you can see that the code is very, is actually the, exactly the same as unmanaged ODP.NET. In fact, you could convert this straight to unmanaged ODP.NET just by changing the reference and the namespace. So if we run it, it should just return a couple employees from that department 20. 
and you can see that that's happened up here. Okay. So you see that using managed ODP.NET, you don't really have to learn any new APIs if you're already un familiar with the unmanaged driver. Uh, you just have to know which assembly you're pulling in, the namespace is different, and that's it. Now, to demonstrate that it is that simple, we're going to take this existing ODP.NET unmanaged application, which does something very, sim uh, very similarly in what you saw. In this case, we're going to access the Scott schema and just select from the EMP table there, same from Department 20 as well, and output the results. So if we do the same here, this is, of course, with unmanaged driver. As you can see, the namespaces being referenced is unmanaged. Let's run this, and you can see that it works. And then we're going to convert this over to the managed driver. So we can see that there's uh, five employees being returned from this Department 20. So let's convert this to using the managed driver. And it is very simple. So all we need to do is, I don't have to remove the old one, but we'll just remove it to make it clean. We'll add a reference, that the same reference that we added before. Scroll down, and we find the Oracle Managed Data Access driver here. We say OK. We see that it's been added. We can see the uh, red squiggly line saying IntelliSense doesn't know what this dot, what, the, what this data access uh, library is, so we can comment that out, and we'll uncomment. Whoops, we'll uncomment the manage data access references. You can see now we're referencing it, and we can now just run it as is. And just one note, you'll know, you'll see that we're using uh, Easy Connect, so we reference the host name, the port to use, and the the database that we're using, or a CL. And it should just work. And we can see that we have the same five results being returned. Okay, so you've seen so far being able to build a very simple managed ODP.NET app. You've seen be able to convert unmanaged to managed. Now, in those both cases, you've seen the TNS be completely in the data source or easy connect to be used. And of course, that's not a very common case. That's a very simple case. Uh, the more common case is to use a .aura file for TNS or something like that. Now, as I explained before this demo began, that managed ODP is sort of homeless now. You know, it doesn't really have a concept of Oracle Home because you can just X copy it, deploy, and you're basically done. So how can it know exactly where its .aura files are for its, uh, for its needs? So what we've done is we have introduced inside the .NET config file, and you can do this in your app config, web config, or your machine.config. Uh, you can include things such as um, this data sources XML tag that we have introduced. And within there, you can create an alias. Here we've defined ORCL. And then within that, you can define your connect descriptor. And it's the same connect descriptor I used earlier. So you can define as many as you want, and your applications can use these connect descriptors. So this is kind of this is a section that Oracle Managed Data Access has, and it's in your configuration uh, section of your config file. Under that, you have the Oracle Data Access Client tag, and we've actually created an Oracle Unmanaged Data Access Client tag as well that you can use for unmanaged ODP.NET that matches uh, this one. Uh, metadata uh, section for section. So what we have in here is we've made it very more, much more modular and easier to manage than what, what uh, existed with the Oracle.data access uh, client one. 
and so unmanaged data access and managed data access are kind of the new versions of how to be able to do the configuration in your .NET config file. And what you see is at, up top you have a version number. Here you can define a specific version you want this config to apply for. If we use star as we have seen here, you, it applies to all. And then we have several sections. One is the data sources section, which you can find you can define data source information. And this is where you define your aliases. And what I can show is in this application, if I run this, it should just work using this ORCL reference. And if we look at the program itself, we use the data source ORCL. And you can see when we run it, the proper results get returned. Now, that's not the only way to define your data source. Uh, if we comment this out, what we can do is uncomment this and show you the uh, yet another way to define your data sources, which is the TNS underscore admin setting. And this is under the settings section uh, of your of your config. And we can point here to a directory location which stores your TNS names.or uh, file. And I have it pointing to an existing Oracle Home network admin directory that I know has a working TNS names.or file, a valid one that I can use. And you know, certainly if I run this again, we get the proper results again. And another tip for you, um, I can even comment this out. Oops. And what you'll see if, well, let's just complete the comment here. What you'll see if I run it now, the application still works. Now, how is that? I've removed all references to ORCL. How did that happen? Well, if you ever install uh, ODP.NET Manage Driver with the Oracle Universal Installer, the uh, GUI installer that Oracle has, we will take um, your TNS names that information, or or your TNS ad, or where you located your your current uh, TNS names that ORA file and all your dot ORA files, and we will automatically point it to uh, to uh, where an existing one is, if you have an Oracle Home already installed that has you know existing uh, uh, .ORA files, we will point to where it is uh, because we can uh, the installer will be able to see what other Oracle Homes are there, and so it will know where your uh, where your uh, uh, network admin directory is, and then it will place that it will take that information and place it in your machine.config. So so just so you know. Uh, then your machine.config is changing when you install with the, the installer and we will add this uh, TNS underscore admin setting to point to that. So I've also got it there because that was a part of the installer. But of course, if you want to override the machine.config, just sit, make your specific setting in your app config and ODP.NET will use that one ahead of those. So that's just a tip. Okay, so what are some of the new features that we have in ODP.NET Managed Driver since we first introduced it? It's been, uh, it's been a little bit of time since we first introduced it with the release of Oracle Database 12C. In that time, we haven't been standing still. We have been trying to make improvements over it, to it to many of the things customers have been asking for. And one of those big things is NuGet support. So with NuGet, it's easy to deploy, easy to start set up your uh, development environment to use applications, easy to find dependencies, and easier easier to uninstall. So we added NuGet support. Uh, it's because Managed Driver fits NuGet very well in being a fully managed assembly. It's small, so it's easy to like pull up as a NuGet package without you know uh, you know having you know a lot of your you know Oracle client files. Um, you know, take over a lot of your machine having different versions, things like that. So we provide the NuGet support. And if you go to NuGet.org and search for Oracle, you'll find 
uh, our NuGet drivers for ManageODP.net and also for NDD Framework 6 to be used with our managed drivers. So those are there. Uh, we've updated them in June 2015 so that you'll be able to uh, get the latest version with a couple new features and bug fixes. So we are regularly going to be updating our NuGet release uh, uh, f as, as we go along since a lot of people use NuGet.org in order to pull down the latest. And of course, we'll host the NuGet packages as well on OTN uh, so that you can download it. Uh, some, p some customers like to use NuGet internally. Uh, they like to host it in their intranet rather than pull it from the internet. Uh, and so they have a server, a NuGet server on the intranet that they have their developers internally uh, access to pull down uh, to pull down assemblies that have been vetted. So you can do that too. Uh, we provide uh, those uh, NUPKGs for you to use. Another feature we added was XMLDB. So all the ODP.NET XML classes that were part of Unmanaged are now part of Managed. So if you want to use XMLDB, with ODP.NET Managed Driver, you now have that ability. We also added Kerberos, and Kerberos is great from a security standpoint if you need to add uh, security for authentication. It allows you to do single sign-on, allows you to do central authentication, and it's uh, to do the setup, this is one of the, uh, as I explained before, Kerberos is one of the features that doesn't have a full .NET implementation available. Uh, with Kerberos 5, um, you can use the MIT Kerberos 401 version or higher for Windows. And what you can do is uh, first uh, install it to be able to acquire Kerberos 5 credentials, but you don't need that anymore uh, when you use it at runtime. We're all, we also added uh, support for MSLSA uh, so that you can use MSLSA uh, in your applications with Kerberos. Another thing we've ha added that's new to database 12C is a new 32-bit kilobyte character limit. So that means instead of being uh, having to have smaller characters, if you want to have slightly larger characters but don't want to uh, take on uh, the additional management of using lobs, you can do that with larger varchars, uh, for example, up to 32K. So you can support much larger. And that's a database 12C feature, so you need database 12C. Uh, these other features, you don't need Oracle database 12C. In fact, uh, we will support ODP.NET manage driver back to Oracle 10.2 database. So you can you can use it. You don't have to upgrade your database. Just use ODP.NET manage 12C. You can connect to an older Oracle database if you want. And I explained this a little bit before. Uh, this was a new feature that we added, the, the managed data access DTC no longer being necessary with .NET Framework 4.5.2 or higher. So you are, if you are using one of the later latest versions of .NET Framework and you use distributed transaction, you don't need this extra DLL to deploy anymore. And this is something that Oracle and Microsoft jointly worked on to develop a solution together. So I do thank Microsoft and I think it goes, just goes to show we, we have a great partnership between the two companies and making sure that our mutual customers uh, can get more benefits from using our technologies together. With that said, this concludes part one of the new features. I want to thank you for listening and I hope you'll stay on for part two. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat window and we'll, we'll answer those questions before we move on to part two. Now you'll see some additional resources up on the screen. Uh, after this uh, uh, this uh, virtual day has ended, you can uh, you can get more information or downloads from OTN, otn.oracle.com slash .net is where to go. If you want to hear about the latest releases, latest news, we announced them on Twitter. You can also ask questions of us on Twitter. It's twitter.com slash oracle.net. And on YouTube, we host uh, many videos about how to use odp.net and Oracle. You can go to a YouTube site there. And if all else fails, you're more than welcome to email me or Christian. Our email addresses are on the screen. So with that said, let's start the Q&A, and I want to thank you for attending this hour. We will, be we will begin part two in a short amount of time.